Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third day of our summer seminar on research integrity. The first day, we homed in on individual researchers and research integrity. Yesterday, we talked about the role of universities and other research institutions in fostering research integrity. Today, today's topic is the role of journals and other stakeholders in research integrity. Another action-packed day. Um, we are here live streaming from Amsterdam in Pakhuis de Zwijger. Um, unfortunately, still virtually uh, live streaming. I mean, you're all still here virtually with us today, so we're excited about that. It would have been nicer if we had all been here physically, but it was not to be. But welcome nonetheless. Um, we have seven speakers today uh, and four pitches. So there's a slight change in the program that I'd like to alert you to. Unfortunately, uh, Sara de Rijke couldn't make it today. She couldn't deliver her talk. But we uh, switched her out, her spot out for Anna Marusic, who was going to speak later in the day. So you'll see the program on your screen. Um, so Anna Marusic will speak today at noon instead of Sarah de Rijke, and then the program will finish a little bit earlier. So we'll finish the, uh, the program with the panel discussion at the end of the day, but it will be earlier than the original program said. So um, there, there's that. Um, so there's, as the previous two days, we have coffee breaks, lunch breaks, so that all speaks for itself. Um, we are, um, the, Q, the Q&A um, will be, done through the chat, sorry, I'm confused here. So there's a chat function and there's a Q&A function. If you wanna ask questions about the talks, please use the Q&A function. If you wanna chat with each other, use the chat function. Um, the questions will be moderated by our online moderator today, Iris Lechner, who's here with us. You can't see her, but she's working really hard to make everything run smoothly. All right, enough said. Um, let me introduce our first speaker for today. And I think he's speaking for the third time, or at least you, you would have been able to see him yesterday and the day before, so he hardly needs any introduction. But Lex Bouter is Professor of Methodology and Integrity at the uh, VU University in Amsterdam and the Amsterdam University Medical Centers. And his topic for this morning is an overview of other research integrity stakeholders. So Lex, without further ado, the floor and the screen is yours. Well, thank you very much, Jeroen. Um, and indeed, my task is to talk about the other stakeholders. Like Jeroen already told you, uh, the first day was devoted to researchers mainly, the second day to funding agencies and also research institutes, and today is for scholarly journals and also the publishers. Um, but there are other stakeholders, and I will mention them, but I will smuggle a little bit as well because I will mainly talk about retractions and their importance. And the purpose of that is to bring that on the floor because I believe it is important and also to provoke a little bit uh, the Q&As and maybe also the talks that will follow today because retractions is not a very visible element in the program so far. Now, these other stakeholders, I take three of them. Governments, learned societies, and the media. Starting with the governments, and, and countries differ quite, quite, quite a lot. Um, some countries have laws, have acts or bills, like they call them in North America, or other types of regulations covering research integrity. Most countries nowadays do have laws for doing research with animals and humans, the, the research ethics side, but not that many countries have laws for research integrity. Um, there are pros and cons of that, of course, that's obvious. When you have a law, you can punish a bit more severely, and that is what these countries do as well, for instance, in Scandinavia and, and the USA, China as well. But when you don't have these laws, there is more room for talking freely about your errors and dilemmas. So there is a trade-off there. Governments can also pose conditions on direct funding of universities, for instance, and research institutes that have to do with research integrity. Thou shall do this, thou shall do that. And that happens in some countries and in other countries not at all. There is also the indirect road, of course. Uh, they can forward money to national research councils or medical research councils and then pose the condition 
make sure that the research integrity is covered and that everyone abides to the European Code of Conduct on Research Integrity, for instance. Hey, that happens also on the European level. Now, some countries do have national committees um, and others don't, national committees for research integrity. When countries do have a national committee, uh, it, it can be twofold, to, to simplify a little bit. Some have direct access, so for the severe complaints, you can go directly for the national committee and, and skip local committees in universities. And other countries, the national committee is only an appeal organization. And in our country, we, we, we like to, to play it democratically and, and complex, of course. We haven't even an appeal uh, a committee. Uh, they are only giving a second opinion in, in the Netherlands, the national committee. And that works quite well, I should say. It's, it's, it, it, you can do it in different ways correctly, I believe. The learned societies, and, and I must admit that I had no clue what learned societies did on the plane of research integrity. Um, I have been involved, um, I'm originally an epidemiologist um, in, in the Code of Conduct for epidemiologists uh, concerning research integrity. But now we have in a, a, a really interesting master thesis student working on what's happening in learned societies. And it turns out that many have code of conducts or documents which are similar. Some learned societies, and we focus on uh, the, the EU, but it, it might be similar in other uh, continents, they have conditions for membership apply, um, that have to do with research integrity. Disciplinary councils happen, it's quite rare, but, but it happened in learned societies. And the advantage is, of course, that many of these research integrity issues, where you want to know for sure what it is about, it needs to be specified for the specific disciplinary field in which you are. And learned societies can, can do that quite well. Um, some offer education, typically e-learning, of course, and, and a few offer certification. So they, they are, seem to pick up their role to make it work, research integrity, from the disciplinary angle. Second one, the media. The, the media are a stakeholder in research integrity, and they can be powerful. The, the regular media, like television, uh, big newspapers, magazines, and what have you. Um, sometimes uh, nature and science have that. That is part scientific journal, part uh, medicine with, with journalists. They are powerful. But also the social media, and we've seen that especially in the COVID pandemic, of course, they can influence the public opinion strongly and be a whistleblower on research integrity. In fact, we talked about that yesterday, anonymous whistleblowers can go to the media and, and enter websites and newspapers in the anonymous mode, and then you can get trial by media. It's all over the place, no investigation has been conducted, um, and you are convicted already in the eye of the public. <coughs> And the media also, uh, they can do good things and bad things. There are reputational risks connected for individuals, for institutions, also for universities and uh, funding agencies specifically. And there is one recent thing that happened yesterday. In Australia, um, a big uh, research funder uh, decided that preprints were not allowed in grant applications of people early career scientists applying for a career grant. That's a bloody shame, of course. Nature wrote about it. The whole world is now in turmoil. Um, and I really hope that they will change that, 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 that bad policy quickly, possibly overnight, because this is so disadvantaged for um, early career researchers. Many of them only have preprints to show what, what they can. So, the media can play a role for the good and for the bad. So far, the other stakeholders. We, we skipped that. We, 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 we couldn't offer you five days of conference, and we sticked to two days. The second thing is retraction, and that's my main topic. Uh, retraction is really an important topic, and, and the main purpose is cleaning the published track record of poor, fraudulent, uh, deadly biased research. It should be clean and it should be removed. 
It's not removed in the sense that you cannot see it anymore. Typically, you get something like this, and this is, uh, we talked about it earlier, Diederik Stapel uh, retraction, one of his papers that was retracted, um, uh, and that uh, is clearly indicated as retracted. You can see it. This is the way you see it on the website of the journal. That doesn't happen always that clear. And this is an example from the COVID pandemic time. Um, you had many rejections during the COVID pandemic. Um, about 160 are, is, is the count. Uh, that, that sounds like a lot, but it's still somewhere between one and five promille of the number of papers published, which is rather typical. Uh, I'll show you a slide la later on that between one or up to three, four, five in thousands of the papers are retracted. Possibly more papers should be retracted, but this, this is what happens uh, currently. But in this case, this, the French guy, Didier Raoul, uh, he published first a preprint and then a paper saying that, that a malaria, anti-malaria drug, hydroxychloroquine, was also good in treating COVID-19 patients. The problem was that it was a poor study, 24 patients. Um, he left out a lot of them, and that was helpful in getting the answer he wanted to have. Um, there were all types of irregularities in the data. It was a mess, and it was detected. There was Twitter storms about it, uh, a lot of stuff, but the damage was done already by then because uh, uh, one of the, well, the former president of the US, I'm not going to mention his name, of course, um, he took the drug, he advertised the drug, and he said, wow, this is a miracle cure. We should buy the whole stock and give it to our American patients. Well, that is more or less what they did, but it was not working at all. Um, and then the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine, the top journals in the biomedical field, they published both papers based on search sphere data um, showing that the stuff, when it does something, it, it has harmful side effects, even also among COVID patients, it doesn't cure them at all. And the embarrassing thing was that these data were also flawed. So these papers were retracted as well. So it was a mess. And, and what is different in the COVID pandemic, this all happened in a few weeks, two months at most. Normally, it takes years to get a paper rejected, but now it was accelerated enormously. So we learned a lot uh, about preprints, about peer review, about rejections in that pandemic. This is an older thing, biomedical uh, mainly, but, but not exclusively. Um, it's 15 years old. Someone needs to repeat this study. It's, it's really interesting. It shows that the top journals, in terms of impact factor, if you still believe in that, have more rejections. You see on the top, Science, Nature, Cell, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet. Um, these are the top journals. <coughs> One might, might wonder, why do they have more rejections? I don't know. The stakes are higher in big journals, so people cut corners more easily when the stakes are high, maybe. The journals are more vigilant, maybe. They are awfully rich, they have large staffs, and they can investigate cases, other journals typically not. And they might be better organized and faster in response, because the stakes for the journal at issue, their reputations are higher as well. I don't know. Uh, I want to say that Rejection Watch, it's an interesting blog website, um, they look at rejections. And this is from the Rejection Watch leaderboard. Um, it's it's uh, the, 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 the list of infamous uh, authors with a lot of rejections. Our leader example, I mentioned before, has, is number six on the leaderboard with 58 rejections. Now, some of you might not even have 58 uh, scientific papers, but he has 58 rejections. It's, it's really a record, a sad record, I should say. Um, and Rejection Watch does something else as well. It, it's wonderful. They have a Rejection Watch database now, and they collect all the retractions um, of the last decades, and they go back as far as they can in the literature. Um, and they have now 25,000 plus rejections. You see on this slide, it's a bit in small print. When you type in Diederik Stapel, you get a number of 58, and you get all the papers of uh, Diederik that are retracted. 
Um, now this is a source of, for research. There are a few groups worldwide, one in Rio de Janeiro, they, they're doing solid research on retractions on the basis of the retraction database. Really interesting assets for evidence-based research on research integrity. This is biomedical, biomedical research as well, that retractions are predominantly uh, investigated in their domain. Time trend, you see number of retractions are growing, both in open access journals and in PubMed indexed regular journals. You see on the right side that it, it is again um, somewhere between uh, one, two, three per mil uh, um, is the number uh, compared to the number of publications. It's growing and that is likely a good thing. It's not, I don't believe that the fact that it's growing it's showing that it's going worse and worse and worse in, in academia. We pay attention more and more and more. That, that would be my theory, but not that much research has been done on that as well. And in the same article, they looked at the reasons for retraction. Uh, that, that was important as well, the reason for retractions. Um, there are many of them, of course. Uh, plagiarism is a big one. Fraud and suspected fraud is, is one. Fake review is a big one, which is spectacular. Um, some of you may know that, of course, but in, in, men, in a number of countries, they have the habit uh, when a journal asks you to mention a reviewer, to mention a famous person, but also to mention a fake email address of that person that goes to you. So then you can write your own reviews and, well, you can be um, really nice to yourself. That's an opportunity, of course. So this, this is, was a scandal. It seems to be going down, but it's still a problem. When you look at this distribution, I don't have the time to dwell too long on it, you see that, for instance, in China and Iran, yeah, that's, that's the orange stuff, the, the fake review is, is rather large. And also, you see that uh, um, uh, plagiarism, that's the green one, is varying between countries quite substantially. Um, so, th there are differences between cultures, between countries, between continents. Uh, we all have our, whole, our, our own problems eh? and we need to solve them as well. Retraction uh, guidelines you can find on the COP website, the Committee on Publication Ethics. A really interesting organization that is catering for journals and publishers mainly, but they have beautiful checklists and guidelines on everything connected with publication. Please have a look if you don't have seen it before. Finally, about the, these retractions, a list of all the problems. Journals are slow, they're really slow. Uh, the journals are reluctant. Authors, um, they need to agree or not to agree um, uh, to retraction. Some journals think that. Uh, cleaning journals from flawed articles or, or sanction for research misconduct, that is the main thing. I started with that. I believe that we should clean the record and don't wait until someone is convicted for research integrity. That will, might take years. You should withdraw the paper within days and that's not yet happening. Uh, the description of retractions are not that well. Uh, it's important to do that better. Uh, probably lawyers are involved and they want to prevent lawsuits, so uh, legal advisors say keep it a bit vague in, in these notices, which is not nice, not, not for research, but also not for researchers. You want to know why retraction is there. And, and one problem is, two problems, one problem is that honorable retractions, so when I discover an error in one of my papers, which happened uh, last year, I want that paper to be corrected or retracted. But I don't want to be on the pile of people who are convicted for research misconduct. I discovered it myself and I want to repair the record. So you need to have a clear batch for honorable retractions, I believe. And the other weird thing is that retractions are still cited so often. A uh, bit less than before they are retracted, but not much less. And why is that? I make the same error. You have a pile of PDFs in your computer and you use that or, or a more sophisticated system to make your reference list. You never go back to the original website of the journal and there you can see it is retracted. You cannot see it in the pile in your, in your notebook. Luckily, now there is software that can check whether papers in the reference list are, have been retracted and increasingly journals are using that. Finally, really finally, Jeroen, I'd like to uh, uh, 
points to a, a very special person, Elizabeth Bick. She is a kind of a detective of photo manipulation. Uh, you have Western blots photos and other types of photos in, in biomedical uh, papers. And, and these are, in fact, the, the data. That, that is where you, what you use to base your conclusion on. And it's quite easy to Photoshop it a little bit to make it more nice, to, to recycle parts of other pictures of yourself or, or of others. Uh, you do that within papers, between papers, anything. And this lady, Elizabeth Bith, she is so good at detecting that. Uh, in the reference, and when you see the presentation PDF, you get the reference. There is a the paper in the New York, uh, 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 the New Yorker, ex ex describing what she does and how she does it. And I mention her here because she has the estimate that 4% of the paper w which have photos, meaning data in, in biomedical papers, 4% are flawed. So, and that is data falsification. And, and it might also be plagiarism when you grab a picture of someone else. 4% is her estimate, and, and that is a lot. And, and she stopped writing to publishers and journals. She only published it on papier because she is so disappointed that journals don't react uh, or react so slowly. And papier is a wonderful platform that is publishing uh, it in an anonymous mode, if you want. You can also have a named mode. And they have a nice uh, um, uh, extension of your web browser when you install it, when you look at the paper and Papier has something on it, plop, you see it on the screen. So journals and publishers don't like that because you are hijacking their websites in a way. But is, it is a way for post-publication peer review. It is a way for mentioning research integrity problems like photo manipulation. Now, the good news is, small advertisement, on October 13, Elizabeth Bick um, and also Boris Barber, he is running the PIP here, will both present a webinar on these things from this same spot organized by the Netherlands uh, Research Integrity Network. And with that, I would like to close. Jeroen. Thank you so much, uh, Lex. Uh, this was um, a pretty spectacular guided tour in the dark side of science. <laughs> so really fascinating. Um, so we, if you have questions, you can pose them through the Q&A. Uh, I see a number of questions are already pouring in. Uh, so let me ask the first one. It's from uh, Roberto Buccione. The retraction watch correlation between journal impact factor and retraction rate is heavily contaminated by many confounding factors, one of which is the fact that, so, that the so-called lower tier journals publish a higher number of articles that will never ever be read by anyone, and therefore no one will find out about anything, apart from Elizabeth Bick, perhaps. So yes, vigilance may be a factor, but probably by the scientific community heavily scrutinizing articles of higher interest and not so much by the journals. What do you think about this? It's completely right. It's, it's true. Um, many articles are probably never read. Uh, most articles are, probably, are, are certainly never cited. So who cares, you could say. Um, you, you can fantasize um, until the cow, cows come home, but, but <laughs> it's not really important and impressive. Uh, so that is true. And, and in the technical sense, yes, that is confounding. Um, and, and that is why I plea for, for new, more multidimensional, multifactorial research in the arena, we, we don't understand a lot of it. And this is a general thing. Research on research integrity is still in its infancy. It, it was completely absent uh, maybe five or ten years ago, um, or, or really tiny, 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 and it's growing enormously, thanks for the European Union and, and the National Research Body funding in this type of research, that there is so much obvious interesting, important questions that have never been researched, and this is one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that sounds plausible. Um, so another thing I was wondering about myself, so a number of years ago, uh, a Dutch newspaper, as, as you know, of course, NRC did a, um, they wrote an investigative journalism piece about the peer review process at Nature, I think it was, or Science, a high impact journal. And one of the things they found was that, in fact, in the uh, review criteria that are sent to reviewers, things like, um, impact or you know, possible relevance, sexiness, if you will, are in fact deemed more important than methodological soundness. And that might factor into why these high impact journals get more attractions eventually 
also. Is that, I mean, do you know if anything has changed in sort of review criteria? Is there more scrutiny now, or is this still going on, you think? Well, to answer this correctly, it, it would take another one hour lecture, <laughs> but the point is, selective reporting is, 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 is there. Select, selection um, by reviewers and editors is there. And, it, and the selection, and that's the awful thing, is not whether the question is relevant and the research has been done sound. No, the selection is mainly on the nature of the research and, and the nature of the answer and the findings. And that leads to publication bias. And, and that is not, well, nature can do that. A New England Journal can do that. I don't mind that much as long as the stuff is published. And, and we are now in the business of solving that by registered reports. There, there has been a lot of talk about it yesterday. That's a real killer of publication bias. And the open journals, like British Medical Journal Open, uh, PLOS One, um, to some extent Nature Communications as well, they publish everything which is, which is okay, uh, relevant and well done. Don't look at the nature of the results because they are flexible. They don't mind. It, it's not more costly to publish 100,000 papers or 10,000 papers. They're digital anyway. So we are in the business of solving this, but, but the real killer of selective reporting and, and, and also of selecting of, of publication bias is the registered report we talked about yesterday. Yeah. Do you see any indication that the high impact journals are adopting those? Reluctantly, yeah. reluctantly. They, they, well, you talk to these people, and they're right, of course. They, they are in, they, they are newspapers in, yeah. in, in the sense, scientific newspapers. So they go for the spectacular stuff, yeah. and and that's not not bad as long as the rest of the stuff is findable. Sure, sure. Yeah, it it, it affects their business model. That's clear. Yeah. Um, so a question from Iris. Um, we talked about second chances in academia yesterday during the panel. Um, after convictions of research misconduct. Um, so how do you feel about second chances in relation to retractions, especially when it's maybe sort of second, third authors who might not be the, you know, the, the, the key wrongdoers? Well, the, this is an interesting question. The, the point is, of course, that a retraction in the mind of many people is a punishment for poor behavior. I would say that is true, but it's not the whole thing. The main thing is to clean the published track record as quickly as possible. Um, and, and yes, co-authors are also co-guilty. Eh? The regular criteria is that when you want to be an author, there is a price to pay, namely that you are responsible for what is being published. Now, some journals now have qualified authorships, and then you can say, well, I have no clue what happened in the laboratory, but I was involved in the design and writing of the paper and data collection, that is okay. As long as it's done before you're caught in a flawed paper, afterwards it doesn't count anymore, of course. So, and, and yes, uh, rehabilitation, uh, retraction, uh, well, none of my papers have been rejected. A few of them have been corrected. I'm, I'm still in business, and I hope that, <laughs> uh, that you agree that I'm still in business. Um, of course, there need to be second chances there. It, it, it's not all or nothing. Yeah. Yeah? And also in criminal law, uh, stealing something small and killing someone, there, there is a range of, of severity there. Also in, in research integrity uh, infringement. Yeah, clearly. Thanks. Um, so uh, perhaps a final question from Rika Tsidlau. Um, what do you think of the danger in open platforms like Papier making false accusations, um, intentionally or not, uh, especially if comments are not removed from these platforms? Well, that's a good point. It's a good point. Um, uh, also, Mariette van der Hove yesterday in the panel discussion, she said, well, I'm not so sure I like Retection Watch. She said about Retection Watch because they are in the business of naming and shaming, of often before any investigation has been concluded. Now, in favor of Retection Watch, I would like to say I know of no cases they had it wrong, but they are a bit early sometimes. That's, that's true, so they run a risk. Um, and also with Papier, uh, they are sued for what they're doing by, by journals, by individuals. Uh, um, I've been discussing with Boris Barber, the, the, the guy even on, uh, that runs uh, Papier, even on Twitter, whether anonymous complaints is such a good idea. Uh, I believe there should be a room for it, but it should be discouraged as much as, as possible. Because we did, talked about yesterday, 
anonymous complaints are awkward because you cannot talk to the complainant. And the complainant doesn't run, as long as the anonymity is there, doesn't run any risks. So you can just throw something on the website and it can be slender. You will never be published for it and it will endanger the career of someone else which is not nice at all, of course. Not nice at all, I agree with that, yeah. for sure, yeah. We're out of time, so thank you very much, Lex, for another wonderful talk, and uh, please give Lex a virtual round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> so that brings us to the uh, second speaker of the day, and I, in fact, I just realized that I didn't actually properly introduce myself when I began this morning. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen me yesterday, I am Jeroen de Ridder. I'm Associate Professor of Philosophy at the uh, Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and also one of the people involved in the larger project uh, on epistemic progress in the university, uh, of which this seminar is, is one output. But enough about me. So let's introduce the next speaker. His name is Josh Joshua Hebgood Koot. Um, he is joining us today on Zoom from Leeds, I believe. Uh, where he is a, a research fellow in the Grounds Project in the School of Philosophy, Religion, and History of Science. His work is mainly in social epistemology and philosophy of language, so Josh is a philosopher. Um, and today he is going to talk about the question, what the point is of authorship? And I assume that uh, the talk will be at least partly based on a paper of his that's been published in the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. So. If you're interested, you can check out the paper for yourself. So Josh, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, happy to have you here. Um, and without further ado, the screen is yours. Excellent, thanks, Joran. I'm just gonna see if I can get this going. Brilliant, okay. That looks like it's working. Is that working your end? Looks good. Okay, excellent. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Yorin, and thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Josh Habgaku, and I'm going to talk today about what the point of authors is. So whereas Yuri's talk um, uh, yesterday or the day before was more about the kind of practical issues involved in managing authorship uh, disagreements from kind of individual scientists, my talk today is going to be a bit more at the kind of policy level, a bit more at the level of journals. So I'm going to be thinking a bit more about uh, some of the conceptual work which is done by authorship, like <laughs> what kind of like things it's doing for the collective process of science, and then thinking a little bit about how authorship guidelines might be uh, crafted so that they can kind of meet those kinds of functions. Okay, so I want to start off by asking a slightly facetious question. And the question is how many physicists it takes to write a paper. So this is a paper from Physical Review Letters. Hopefully you can see kind of at least um, the, the kind of grammar of what's on the front page of this paper. Um, so this is a paper from 2015, and it's a combined measurement of Higgs, the Higgs boson's mass in PP collisions at, blah, 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 doesn't matter. It's a improved measurement of the mass of Higgs bosons. And it's a paper that came out of CERN. It's an interesting paper because it comes out of both projects at CERN. It comes out of both the Atlas project and the CMS collaboration. So they often work separately, but they work together on this paper. Now, if you've got um, good screen resolution or really good eyesight, one of the things you'll notice is that um, there's a kind of single author on the top of this paper, G add, and then little et al, immediately underneath the name of the two collaborations. Next to, uh, the et al is a small asterisk, and the asterisk takes you to the end of the paper. So there were too many authors to list on the front page, so they put the authors right at the end of the paper. There's a long list with a set of um, <laughs> complicated further asterisks indicating where people are at, uh, and some other details. So the list goes on, uh, took up four pages, eight, I think overall there's uh, 14 pages of authors here, all extremely uh, uh, meticulously annotated with yeah, where they've come from, which project they're on. A number of the authors of the paper are deceased at the time of publication as well. Um, 
And there's something kind of puzzling about this, especially if you're uh, someone who comes from a humanities discipline where papers are singly, often singly authored or a discipline where um, papers are authored by just one or two people. And you might think that something's gone terribly wrong here. Right, that uh, CERN, this like massive scientific institution at the forefront of scientific discovery, has like really abused authorship or something. Gone something really, really badly wrong here. Um, all of these people can't have possibly worked on the project. And if you dig in a little bit, it turns out, yeah, that's right. And CERN are pretty straightforward about this. They, they have an authorship policy where everyone who works on a project gets authorship credit on all papers. And all you need to do is have worked on the project for a certain amount of time. So lots of people who are authors on this paper, um, won't have read it, might not be aware of this paper, probably not for this one because it's quite a well-known paper, but if you talk to a high energy physicist, they'll say something like, yeah, um, some of the people, some of the old school people, they do read all their papers, but for me, I've just got papers kind of like stacking up on my Google Scholar and I don't read them because it would take all my time to read all my papers. Okay, so, I don't want to pick on high energy physics here. I think there's something kind of reasonable going on here. There's a large scale collaboration. Lots of um, effort will be taken to collect data on exactly who's worked on what. And they've come up with a policy to kind of manage that data while making sure that everyone working on the project is credited. What I think this example does show is there's a kind of like emerging crisis going on in authorship in science. And that crisis is as the size of collaborations gets bigger and as the number of authors um, increases and the number of papers which are authored also increases. Um, the status of authorship is increasingly coming under conceptual strain, right? It's being used to do a lot of work and it's not clear whether it actually can do all of that work. And what we see across um, lots, of lots of different disciplines is increasingly divergent ways of handling authorship. This in high energy physics is maybe one kind of extreme way of handling authorship, but you can see different disciplines starting to go off in their own different ways. Okay, so there's a bunch of kind of um, problems which are overlapping, which are often discussed in um, research ethics connected with authorship. So there's issues about people being confused or um, getting into disagreements that are ultimately kind of futile about what the norms are for assigning positions on uh, the byline. When you come into discipline, you think, oh, it must be clear there are a set of rules. And once you start to, to talk to people from a bunch of different disciplines, you realize people are handling it lots of different ways. And when you get into a disciplinary collaboration, often a really important disagreement is about whose disciplines authorship norms should be used. There's also big problems about flouting of disciplinary norms, often which is enabled by this very unclarity. But it's not clear like um, what the system of order ordering is. Is it like who needs the publication most, who's done the most work, who's most senior, who believes the result the most, uh, who supervised the work. It's gonna get really easy to see how um, abuse can start to happen. There's also prevalence of ghost authors. So um, this is a term coined in medical sciences to talk about uh, researchers who've written the paper but are then left off the byline, typically because they're working for a um, um, pharmaceutical company and leaving them off the byline means that you don't have to acknowledge the support of or the association with that company. And it looks like ghost authors are pretty common. There's, um, I'm forgetting the figure now, it's something like 30% 30, 30 or 50% in this Whistler and all paper of papers look like they have ghost authors. Uh, that should come with a big <laughs> uh, caveat, go check the paper. Um, yeah, we get into these irresolvable disagreements and from the author's side as well, right, from the reader's side as well, right, you start to get like massive problems in like reading a byline as soon as you start to read outside of your uh, discipline. Okay, so engaging with the theme today of thinking about how research integrity interacts with journals, I want to just reflect for a second on like whose problem this is. So, right, Yuri was talking about how this is a problem for researchers, they end up getting into debates about how to negotiate their bylines and into difficult issues about how, who gets recognized most which bit of work. It's also a problem for journals, right? They're dealing with abuses of authorship and um, looks like increasingly journals are expected to and should have um, like uh, set out, pre-set out policies for how people should assign authorship. It's also going kind of ascending levels of um, complexity within science. It's a big issue for disciplines, right? If disciplines want to make sure that they're fairly 
training credits and the issues about priority of discoveries, which are often associated with publication, who gets to be authors on the paper. Um, then disciplines ought to have, be able to manage their authorship um, uh, uh, practices within a discipline and kind of <laughs> ascending just to the level of science in general, as we'll see a bit later on in the talk, uh, there's actually a real important sense in which uh, authorship actually matters for the collective progress of science overall. It plays an important role in incentivizing research, uh, incentivizing research that's like efficient and is going to get the most out of the researchers we got. Okay, so um, just kind of returning to the theme that there's a kind of crisis in authorship, there's a number of proposals out there to kind of reform authorship. They take a number of different forms, so there's proposals to allow collective authors uh, to abandon authorship completely, to regiment authorship, so there's the ICJME uh, guidelines and the contributor roles taxonomy um, guidelines, we're going to come back to them a bit later on. It's proposed to randomize the byline of papers, to supplement authorship with our contribution statements, or to allow, allow pseudonymous authorship. So some of these proposals are like uh, out there, um, not sure anyone's fully like abandoned authorship, um, but it's not, it's not like there's a, a consensus about which of these is the right way to go, and several of them have often been combined together. So um, medical journals both have contribution statements and uh, regimen authorship as well. Okay, so this is the kind of position we're in. Authorship looks like it's in a position of a bit of a mess. There's some cr ongoing crises that are causing people, uh, scientific disciplines and science trouble. And there's a question about how authorship can be organized. And more concretely, like this question of, for a particular paper, who should be an author on it? Okay, so here's what I'm gonna try and do today in the rest of this 45 minutes. So my central question today is going to be um, what the point of authorship is, what the functions of authorship are in um, the kind of collective process of science. Okay, and I'm going to be arguing that authorship plays a bunch of different functions. It's involved in allocating credit, um, constructing a kind of speaker for a paper, in enabling credibility judgments, supporting accountability, and creating what I'm going to call, kind of call an intellectual marketplace. Okay, now I'm going to argue that no one status, no singular status of authorship, kind of that we're going to assign people a status or not, can simultaneously play all of these functions. And if you want something to play all these functions, we're going to get into problems where, uh, in certain cases, we're going to want to say both that someone is and isn't an author. And I'm going to kind of lay out a speculative proposal, which I'm going to call the C. Uh, SWG proposal, which is that journals should replace authors, get rid of authors, and replace them with four different statuses, contributors, spokespeople, writers, and guarantors. Okay, so this is partly a philosophy paper, it's also partly a policy paper at a very abstract level. So there's two kinds of parts going on. There's a kind of conceptual uh, claim about like what the functions of authorship are, which we'll get in the um, uh, first section. Uh, a claim about some of the tensions going on, conceptual uh, tensions about authorship, and then this proposal that's going to happen at the end, right? So you can, by the first, you can think that I'm right about the conceptual functions of authorship, uh, while thinking that, no, there's some problems with this, like, proposal, maybe it's just too complicated or something like that. But even if you think that, I hope that there's some kind of, um, the picture of the functions of authorship can help you to think about what the, um, what's the issue in debates about who should be an author on paper. Okay, two quick clarifications because uh, it wouldn't be a philosophy paper without some caveats. So throughout, I'm gonna be using science as a kind of general stand-in for like academic research. So Wissenschaft, or I think in Dutch, the inclusive word is Wettenschaft. Uh, apologies for terrible pronunciation. And I'm gonna talk throughout as well as if authorship were a social status, not a kind of status determined by what research you actually did, right? So I'm gonna be assuming that a byline, people get listed on the, front page of a paper that confers, that makes them the author of the paper, it doesn't describe their status of authorship. So that means that if someone's left off the byline of a paper, they aren't an author, although perhaps they should be an author. Okay, that's just for um, uh, clarity and consistency, nothing important really turns on that. Okay, good. So first I'm going to talk about the functions of authorship, then I'm going to give you the problem cases, then we're going to run through the proposal to reform authorship. Okay. So let's start off with the functions. Okay, so 
we've seen these kind of already um, previewed, but I'll just run through these and kind of motivate each of these functions, thinking about uh, yeah, a bunch of a bunch of different issues that open up um, how we might want to think about authorship. Okay, so the first function of authorship is to allocate credit for an intellectual uh, achievement. Okay, so there's an important sense in which kind of uh, scientific papers serve to mark achievements in science, right? Just they serve to mark like discoveries, important new additions to the body of scientific knowledge. Right? A scientific paper can't be like, um, well, I mean, this is some of the issues about like uh, replications, but like, at least in one sense, we want to say that like, you can't um, publish a scientific paper that just like makes the same claim as other people have made in the past, unless it's in the special case of uh, replication. Okay, so, scientific papers mark discovery. And then we might think what happens with authorship is authorship is a way of allocating credit for uh, that intellectual achievement, right? So when a group of people have brought about an achievement together, um, authorship is like drawing a line around the group of people who are responsible for that achievement. Okay. Now, so that's a kind of conceptual point about discovery. Another way into thinking about this is by thinking about cases in which people are left off authorship and what goes wrong when people are kind of wrongly left off the byline. Um, so there's a bunch of different cases here, like there's a lot of um, very well-known cases of people being left off the byline. Um, I'm gonna talk just quickly about uh, an example from the history of science. So um, Chapin in his work on invisible technicians talks about early modern science and the way in which lots of um, early modern uh, scientific experimental setups were involved a gentleman scientist who had a massive team of labyrinths who'd work around them. And the labyrinths would do most of the kind of like actual work and the observations and the um, running of the machines. And then the gentleman scientist would write everything up under their own name. So there's a lovely illustration here on the slide from Chapin's paper. Uh, this is of Otto van Goyrich's air pump. We see the air pump at the top, the kind of important scientific stuff. And then at the bottom, the workers who are running the air pump, who are uh, depicted as faceless, their hats covering their eyes, and they're kind of almost as if they're merely parts of the scientific machine that's carrying things on. Right, we might think something has gone wrong here, right? These people are also responsible, at least in part, for the intellectual achievement. And by being left off, they've been denied credit that's due to them. Okay, so there's some systematic um, uh, phenomena in the background here. So there's the Matthew effect introduced by the sociologist Robert Merton, uh, which is about the phenomena of people uh, who are both put on um, the byline, one getting more credit than the other because they're better known. Um, that seems like it's bad for the same reason, right? Like the better known person isn't due more credit, but they're getting more. Uh, there's also the Matilda effect introduced by Margaret Rossiter. Um, kind of as a knowing kind of nod to the Matthew effect, which is about the phenomenon of women being left off uh, systematically from bylines. And there's a kind of interesting uh, connection up to some recent work in epistemology about the ways in which people are disbelieved and denied uh, credit for what they know. So there's some uh, there's a kind of important body here, a body of literature here about epistemic injustice, people being denied. Um, uh, the kind of full exercise of their epistemic agency, epistemic oppression, and epistemic appropriation, right? The kind of knowledge that people have being appropriated from them and ascribed to other people. Okay, so looks like when people get left off the byline kind of inappropriately, at least one of the things that goes wrong is they're denied credit that they're due. Okay, so there's some tricky kind of conceptual issues here, right? So there's some issues in saying exactly what the achievement of a paper is, right? Is it the thing which is discovered? Well, that would mean that uh, credit was also due to the people who uh, have gone before, who've done work which the paper builds on. So we might want to say that the discovery is a kind of increment, the increase in scientific knowledge. Otherwise, like everyone who's worked in the field is going to get uh, uh, on as an author on every new paper. Um, there's issues about how we think about what kind of achievement uh, is involved in scientific discovery, whether it's a specifically intellectual achievement or a kind of practical achievement. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna argue for this, but I think there's a good uh, reason to say that we shouldn't be drawing this distinction at all. There isn't an important distinction here and that we should be a lot more capacious in who gets uh, assigned credit. And there's a kind of issue here, which people will be familiar with if they've uh, 
negotiated authorship uh, disputes about what counts as a significant contribution, right? I'm not gonna uh, assume that significant contribution means very much because um, I think that's often determined by context, right? What, what counts as significant. Okay, so this gives us our first function. So assigning someone the status of an author on a paper is a way to attribute to them full or partial credit for the intellectual achievements of that paper. Okay, second function. So this is constructing a speaker. So start with a different idea about publication. So we might think the publication is a special kind of assertion. It's a way of putting forward the claim as true. It's a special kind of assertion because it's written rather than spoken. So it's a bit different from me saying that it's um, uh, kind of gray outside because it's England. Um, and it's also special because it's institutionally authorized, right? So um, a journal has to give permission to a set of authors to put forward a set of claims as um, true in their, in their journal, right? Okay, so if publication is a special kind of assertion, then we might think that it inherits some of the general features of assertion from kind of like ordinary spoken discourse, right? And one of the features of assertion in general, which epistemologists have spent a lot of time thinking about and philosophers of language, is the way that assertion generates obligations, so kind of intellectual and in some way like kind of uh, conversational obligations as well. So here's a kind of uh, set of obligations which are popular in literature and epistemology and philosophy of language. So people think there's a sincerity norm on assertion, so you should only say something if you believe it. There's kind of consistency and coherence norms. As you go on saying things through a conversation, you better uh, be consistent in what you say and form a coherent whole. There's a defend and retract norms. So if you put something as true, then you're committed to defending it, or if you're not gonna defend it to take that claim back. And there's also a knowledge norm, which says that you should only assert something if you know that it's true. Okay, so if these are general, the kind of normative, uh, features of assertion, then we might think that also features of the special kind of institutionally authorized assertion in publication, right? Um, and it turns out like that looks like a pretty good um, hypothesis. So we might think the one thing that goes wrong um, when uh, people publish fraudulently is that they express claims they don't believe. Uh, we would, one of the issues that goes on with writing, especially writing with co-author teams, there's a lot of issues about like how you make it all of the paper coherent if different people have written on it. Um, the defend and retract norm uh, looks like it relates pretty closely to some of the issues about scholarly retraction, uh, which Lex was just talking about. So if you put forward the claim as uh, uh, true um, in a scientific journal, then under certain conditions, you've got to either defend it or retract it. And the defense maybe happens more in the um, corresponding author than in kind of uh, responses to other papers. Uh, and we might also think there's a kind of like connection here, although this is a little bit more murky uh, between the idea that you should know the claims you make and the kind of like evidence which one ought to have as a scientist. Okay, so looks kind of plausible that some of these norms are also gonna to apply to authors, the set of authors that are on a paper. So here's an idea that I wanna take forward, which is that um, one thing that goes on when we construct an author list is that we're constructing a speaker who can take up these kinds of intellectual responsibilities. So this isn't backward looking like the credit function. This is more about constructing a speaker who can kind of fulfill prospective uh, intellectual obligations. Now there's a really murky issue here about who these obligations should apply to. Do they all apply to all of the authors? Do they apply in a distributed way when different parts of the obligations apply to different people? Do they apply to just one or do they apply to the collective? Okay, I'm not gonna, um, resolve that here, but I'm going to come back to it later. Okay, so this gets us a second function. So a function of assigning a set of people as the authors, sorry, the typo there, of a paper is to create a epistemically, intellectually responsible speaker. Okay, third function. So this is about credibility judgments. Okay, so um, some of the issues that Michael was talking about on Wednesday were about like, uh, some of the issues around preprints and whether preprints are trustworthy and how preprints maybe differ from published results in journals. So it's a question for a reader of science, like when you should trust things that you read in a journal paper. It's especially important if you're reading outside of your uh, kind of scholarly expertise, so you can't go through and kind of verify the argument if you're just looking for, does this conclusion look right? And you can't uh, work through the reasons. So there are a bunch of ways 
you think? In which you can determine whether you should trust the results. So you can look at what journal it's in, the university authors come from, the method and whether there's open science badges, the lab reputation. Uh, maybe you rely just on peer review and community checking to have uh, verified the results. Or you might just be like skeptical about all the results you read. So there's a, there's a big complicated story here about how we determine whether we should trust results. But at least part of the story is that uh, individual authors by putting themselves on a paper are putting up their kind of credibility for the results, right? Um, and you see some kind of funny cases here where um, often some of the point of putting on like a senior scientist onto a paper is to ensure that people read it and people take it seriously because they are giving it like uh, the credibility with maybe it's due, okay? So just as with the uh, construction of a speaker, there's a bunch of complicated issues here about whose credibility matters. Is it the lead author? Is it the average of credibility rankings we should take, the highest, the lowest, the journal's ranking, or the lab's ranking? Complicated issues here, um, which are, I'm not going to fully resolve, but I'm going to say a bit more about at the end. Okay. So this gives us a third function, that a function of assigning a set of people as the authors of the paper is to enable readers to make judgments about how credible the results of that paper are. Okay. Um, fourth function, so this is about accountability. Okay, so one thing, um, I guess this is not uh, controversial to say in a seminar on research integrity, one thing that's important is having research which is uh, accountable to the community. Now, one reason I think this is important is that a certain kind of well um, calibrated community pressure within a uh, community of inquiry can provide a certain kind of practical reason which incentivize people to do better research, right? So if you know that you're going to get um, certain kinds of negative reactions and certain kinds of censure, if you publish bad research, uh, it's a kind of practical bad consequence, then you've got a reason to kind of do more research to make sure that you get above the line of like uh, what counts as good research. Okay, so we might think here that just as in the moral domain, the kind of attitudes which we have to one another of uh, what Strawson calls kind of reactive attitudes of like praise and blame that give people reasons to act morally. Similarly, what Deborah Tollison calls the intellectual reactive attitudes, kind of intellectual censure and praise, um, give people reasons to do better research, right? Okay, so there's a way in which uh, accountability leads to better research, and uh, we want to make sure that the right people are being held accountable. Okay, so again, we've got the same kinds of issues here. Who should be accountable? Is it all the authors? One. Is it a distributed uh, phenomenon or is it the collective? Again, I'm not gonna resolve that kind of question. One point to just pick up here, and this is pulling on um, some joint work that I've done with Heis and Dang, um, is that one of the issues about anonymous authorship, so this is associated with um, the proposals in the Journal of Controversial Ideas, which lets authors publish anonymously or under a pseudonym. So one of the issues with that kind of proposal is that it removes this important feature of the kind of, uh, intellectual accountability, which is really important for making sure that research is good, right? Research is uh, responsible. Okay, good. Um, so this is our fourth function. A function of assigning a set of people as the authors of the paper is to create a target for praise if the paper is epistemically good and censure if it's bad and thus push up the standards within the intellectual community. Okay, final function, there's five of them because authorship is complicated. And that's the function of creating an intellectual marketplace. Okay, so here's a hopefully uncontroversial claim that science aims to produce knowledge. Here's a puzzling uh, phenomenon. Um, so knowledge is a public good, right, in the sense of the economists like to talk about. So it's uh, not rivalrous and it's uh, not excludable, which means that you can't stop other people from using it if you've got knowledge. And you having knowledge doesn't stop other people from having knowledge. Okay. Now, the fact that knowledge is a public good means that it's going to lead to what economists call the public goods problem, which is that if individuals pursue it individually um, by themselves, they're not going to uh, pursue it in the most efficient way, right? They're going to diverge from the most efficient way of uh, inquiring. Now, one thought here is that in science, one way of managing the public goods problem is to take knowledge as a public good, but associate that public good with a private good, which is rivalrous and is excludable, which um, 
uh, researchers are interested in um, getting hold of. And this part of the good is authorship, right? So authorship is associated with discovery. Discovery is um, excludable. If you discover something, then you can't, someone else can't discover it. And because of the way journals work, you being an author on a paper stops other people from those also uh, excludable. Right, and why is that a good thing? Well, if there's a set of kind of private goods in an economic system, then we'll get uh, the kind of familiar functions of the invisible hand to create an intellectual marketplace, which leads to both an efficient division of labor across different kinds of scientific projects, and also uh, to scientists like um, putting in kind of more uh, intellectual efforts into their uh, projects. So more labor is put in, more labor is incentivized to be put in by scientists, and we get an efficient division of labor, right? So if you're kind of uh, familiar with the work of like Adam Smith, you're getting some kind of sense of an inv the invisible hand of science kind of playing some role in the background here. Right. So it looks like this is good for science collectively. There's a lot of issues here about how um, different amounts of um, credit is assigned, so not credit, but different accounts of um, uh, this kind of good of authorship are uh, assigned for co-authorship or individual authorship and how that incentivizes people to pursue research projects by themselves or with others. Complicated issues there. Um, good, okay. So this is the market function that says that a function of assigning a set of people as the authors of a paper is to create a system of private goods which are apt for market mechanisms. Okay, good. So these are our set of functions of authorship. So uh, to assign credit, to construct a speaker, to help readers to work out how credible um, results are, to enable accountability and to create an intellectual marketplace. Okay, so that looks all good, right? <laughs> all things we should want uh, in science, but there's some problem cases, right? And these are four problem cases in which it looks like all these functions are gonna point us in different directions about who should be an author. Okay, so here are the cases, disbelieving contributors, uh, credibility manipulation, invisible technicians, and radically collaborative research. Okay, so the first case is a case of a large, or kind of, it doesn't need to be large, or a small group of people who've worked together, put in a lot of work onto creating a data set and to doing some analysis of it. Uh, and then um, a smaller group of people, or perhaps most of the group of people, decide that they can get some controversial result out of that data set. Um, but there's one scientist in the group, let's say, who doesn't believe that result. Okay, so what should happen with authorship on the kind of paper that publishes that controversial result? Well, it looks like everyone's put in important credit-worthy work into producing the data set and to doing analysis on it, but by putting themselves up as an author on that paper, the disbelieving author is going to be maybe being um, disingenuous about what they believe, right? So credit looks like it pushes us one way and issues about the responsibilities associated with being a speaker pushes us another. Okay, credibility manipulation. Uh, so this is uh, um, Harriet Zuckerman, who was Robert Merton's wife, who um, did a bunch of uh, interviews with um, Nobel winning scientists. And there's an interesting bit, which is um, uh, quoted in Merton's paper on the Matthew effect, uh, where she quotes a Nobel winning scientist saying, I got really, I got really het up, really um, uh, confused about whether I should be authors on, whether I should be an author on my uh, students' papers, because if I'm an author on my students' papers, well, that get read and it will get taken seriously. But if I'm an author on their paper, because of the Matthew effect, I'm better known than they are, um, they're not going to get the credit that they're due, right? So it looks like you can put a, you can put someone on the paper and that will help it get more credibility, maybe the credibility that is due, but that's going to mess up the um, uh, credit allocations. Um, so again, we've got a kind of like tension between different functions of authorship. Okay. Third kind of problem case is our invisible technicians. Uh, again, Otto van Gorek's uh, air pump here, right? So one point about invisible kind of invisible technicians is that they might not understand, um, sorry, they, uh, yeah, might not understand a lot of the um, uh, scientific process which goes into producing results, and they might not be very credible in the intellectual economy at the time. One of the points of Chapin's A Social History of Truth is to say that only gentlemen in early modern England could be taken as credible and invisible technicians weren't gentlemen. So if we want papers to get taken seriously, 
and for the intellectual kind of responsibilities associated with authorship to be fulfilled, we should leave invisible technicians off. But if we want credit, then credit to be fairly just should be to them, we should want them on. Um, finally, um, in cases of uh, what Hubner, Kukler, and Winsberg call radically collaborative research, a massive uh, distributed projects, so you think of multi-site trials in medicine, like uh, climate change research and um, high energy physics, it might be that no person is able to understand exactly like what's gone on in all of these different parts of this complex uh, research process. And they, Hubner, Cook and Winsberg, use that idea to argue that there should be no authors on radically collaborative research. And there's something kind of right about this, right? So no one can fulfill the intellectual responsibilities in these cases. And no one can be held account like accountable by themselves. Um, maybe even uh, no one's no group of people are capable of putting themselves up to be held accountable. But also, there's a bunch of people who deserve credit, right? So here's what we've got. So there's a bunch of cases where it looks like we should both want to include and exclude people as authors, and the functions are pointing us in different ways, right? So credit is pointing us towards uh, including people in all these cases, and other functions of authorship are pointing us away from including people. Okay, so third part of the paper. So I'm gonna talk a bit about a proposal to reform authorship in a way that resolves some of these conceptual issues. Okay, so that's the kind of conceptual bit of the paper out of the way. This turns into a bit more of a policy proposal. Okay, so there are some options here, right? So we could pick a set of coherent functions for authorship and kind of, sort of drop some and then design a set of authorship guidelines around those functions. So we could just take credit and say authorship is just about credit. It's not about all these other things or say it's just about incentivizing research. It's not about all these other things, right? That would deal with these kinds of uh, conflict cases. <clears throat> a second option would be to say, well, just, well, let's accept the inconsistency of the concept of authorship and um, allow individual scientists to handle the um, complex kind of on, by themselves on a kind of ad hoc basis, right? So put the, put the onus back onto individual scientists. I'm going to take a third option, which is to try, try and design a new practice, which both preserves all the functions of authorship, unlike the first proposal, but also addresses their inconsistency, unlike the second proposal. Okay, so um, slightly facetiously, this gets associated with uh, the kind of death of the author trope in literary studies, uh, associated with Michel Foucault and Roland Barthes. Um, and there's a kind of similar idea going on here, right, that we should get rid of the scientific author, but I think it's important that we put something in her place. Okay, so just a kind of like bit of intellectual history here. There's actually a long history of trying to get rid of an author and replace it with other things. Uh, so Saint Bonaventure in the 13th century talks about the fourfold, so he's a uh, scholastic theologian, uh, talks about the fourfold ways of making a book and distinguishes between scribes, compilers, commentators, and authors, right? So there's a bunch of different ways of putting your name associated associated with a uh, scholarly tome, a work of theology, and not all of them are authorship. Right, so we've got this idea also in literary studies from Barth and Foucault, that uh, there's a kind of hermeneutic death of the author, right? But in works of literature, we shouldn't be using the author to interpret a work of, work of literature. Uh, but also within medical sciences, there's um, some interesting papers in uh, the 90s associated uh, with particularly with Rennie, but the important paper is with Jan Emanuel called When Authorship Fails, which argues that we should replace the status of author with contributors and guarantors. So my proposal is gonna build on that one and kind of take things a little bit further and motivate things with some, these um, general conceptual functions of authorship. Okay, so here's the proposal. So do away with authors on papers and replace it with four different statuses, right? So the first status is that the contributor, the second of a writer, the third of a spokesperson, and the fourth of a guarantor. Okay, so here's a little description of these roles. So a contributor is someone who's, at least in part, credit worthy for the discovery, the increment in scientific knowledge which has been made. A writer is someone who contributes to the writing of the project and takes responsibility for the sincerity, coherence and consistency and knowledge norms. The spokesperson is someone who takes responsibility for the defend or attract norm. That's a little bit like a corresponding author. And the guarantor is someone who provides their credibility, is held accountable, and also expresses sincerity. 
So what we've done with this um, kind of explosion of authorship into different roles is taken the different conceptual functions of authorship and associated them with distinct statuses, right? So contributor answers to the credit function, the um, functions associated with constructing a speaker have been split up a little bit. So some of them are taken up by the writer role, some by the spokesperson role, and some by the guarantor role. Accountability um, is similarly split between the writer and the guarantor. The guarantor is kind of like, uh, in a sense, like uh, putting up their credibility for the whole result and then should be held accountable. But the research has been done by the um, people who are contributors. And there's going to be some important issues here about how all these different roles are kind of rewarded as well. So they're all incentivized. Okay. So one thing to say about this proposal is that it doesn't mean that every paper should have exactly four authors. There are ways of like allocating a set of people like multiply across these different roles, right? So we might have everyone be an author and also a writer, a spokesperson and guarantor. We could have some people being a contributor, some other people being a writer, and then the set of those also being spokesperson or guarantors. Or we could have um, kind of people who are just guarantors but not contributors. There's lots of ways of distributing roles here. Okay, and this is important because this is going to help us to resolve the four problem cases we talked about before. So in each of those cases, functions of authorship pulled in different directions. We can just resolve them by saying, <coughs> in those cases, people should be uh, contributors, but not writers, spokespeople, or guarantors. Okay, so uh, I've just got a couple more minutes left. That's that right, you're in. So a few, um, but stop me if I go over time. Uh, so some benefits of this proposal. So it clears up the problem cases. Uh, because people can be listed as contributors, but not the rest of the roles. It's rather flexible. There are lots of ways of distributing these different roles. So it means it's able to represent a lot of different kinds of research cultures. Um, it can also be used, um, yeah, kind of straightforwardly by just like reorganizing the byline and having these roles listed underneath the title of a paper, but it can also be useful in just clarifying what's at issue in authorship disputes, like what's what matters when people are disagreeing. Um, it's important that it doesn't, doesn't uh, give a recipe for determining who should play which role um, for, for a particular paper, but my hope is that it allows people to at least be asking like coherent questions about what's at issue in authorship disputes. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to compare this proposal with the uh, ICJME and contributor roles taxon uh, contributor roles taxonomy proposal for regimenting authorship, and just kind of point out some ways in which the CSWG pro uh, proposal has some like nice features. Okay, so the uh, hopefully familiar ICJME guidelines, uh, which originally came out of medical science, are a kind of regimentation of authorship. And they say that there are four conditions which are required for someone to be an author. So they better made substantial contributions, they better drafted the work or revised it, they better give final approval for the version to be published, and they've got to be accountable for all aspects of the work. So first point, looks like we're seeing these functions like pretty, um, the functions that I've talked about being expressed here, right? So the credit function, issues about uh, writing consistency and coherence, uh, approval and sincerity, and accountability. So good extra evidence for those functions being important for authorship. Um, one real problem that happens with the ICJME guidelines is that they force a particular model of uh, authorship onto lots of different kinds of research cultures, right? So uh, basically, I think what they do is they take like the status is associated with a single author and say, every person who is a co-author has to have all of those features. And that means that it's not possible to have like some people who contributed and then other people who write it, wrote the paper and then other people maybe who aren't, didn't contribute, who uh, want to be held accountable because they say, this is a really important result. I'm a big figure in this field, take my word for it. Okay, so there's something good about this proposal with conceptual clarity, but it's not uh, as flexible as the proposal that I'm making. Um, just on the contributor roles taxonomy, so this is a proposal to, um, supplement the byline with a description of who's done what in research. So there's a kind of, uh, what do they call it? A uh, controlled vocabulary of different things which people have done in research uh, and people can list themselves under the different things that they've done. So it's both writing, but also a bunch of different kinds of research. Two points to make about this proposal. It's not clear that this set of descriptions are gonna apply to every kind of research that's been done. Uh, as a humanities scholar, as a philosopher, I'm like, 
yeah, I don't know if I'd list myself in like any of these except for like conceptualization. So there's a question about how to make a description of research which applies to all disciplines. But also this proposal just deals with the allocation of credit, right? It doesn't deal with any of the other functions of authorship. So there's an important way in which it kind of only gets us part way towards um, uh, representing the complexity of authorship. Okay, good. So what have I done today? So I've given you a bunch of um, functions associated with authorship. I said there's five of them. Um, and I've said that there's some problem cases in which these functions get into conflict and made a proposal, the CSWG proposal, which gives us a story about how authorship might be reformed in order to deal with those kinds of problem cases and make authorship more um, conceptually clear. Okay, so as Euron said at the beginning, this is a, a talk derived from a paper that's forthcoming in the British Journal of Philosophy of Science. If you're after references, that's a place to go to. Uh, and the proposal of the paper has been applied to its very paper. So on the first page of it, you'll see um, a version of the contributor spoke to write to guarantor um, proposal um, where all of the people who've done really important credit worthy work on this paper are contributed. But because it's me that wrote it up, I, it's me that's the spokesperson writer and guarantor. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Josh. That was wonderful, very rich, uh, subtle, historically informed. Um, thanks a bunch for that talk. So we have a bunch of questions coming in in the Q&A, and if you still have questions, you can continue to ask them in the Q&A. Um, so first one, someone who actually appears to be from the high energy physics community, Jeff Templon. Um, so he asks, the difference between spokesperson and guarantor, guarantor, I forget, um, is not clear to me. So in high energy physics, we already have spokespersons. It's hard for me to imagine who the guarantors, guarantors would be. Can you speak to that? Yeah, good. So I've um, I kind of slightly bracketed some of the complexities of the proposal because uh, it gets kind of finicky. Um, so just conceptually, the difference between a spokesperson and a guarantor is about like whose response to um, go back on the slides. Um, so the spokesperson is kind of pretty similar to a corresponding author, right? That's the person who takes responsibility for the defender retract norm, so someone who answers questions uh, about the paper and defends it in subsequent uh, um, correspondence. Whereas the guarantor is the person who's putting themselves, person or, or a group, who uh, provides their credibility, is held accountable and expresses sincerity um, for the claims that are made. So the guarantor could be someone who um, both guarantor and spokesperson could be people who didn't contribute to the research at all. Like that's that's okay, as long as they're not listed as a contributor as well. Uh, but the spokesperson needn't be someone who believes the results, right? They're just someone who's like uh, there to defend the results. Whereas the guarantor does need to believe the results and to kind of like be held accountable because they're putting their credibility up for the group. So just on high energy physics, um, I think this is an interesting case that, um, illustrate something I haven't talked about, where it looks, at least to me, from the um, kind of science studies that I've read about the high energy physics community, that what happens is that the collaboration or the project plays the role of guarantor. The project puts up this kind of like institutional reputation to play the guarantor role, but one individual puts themselves up to um, uh, play the role of spokesperson. So, I just like caveat on that a little bit. That would be like how I think you'd reconstruct the intellectual culture of high energy physics within the proposal. And I think that's kind of what's implicitly going on. So we've got a collective playing the role of guarantor and then an individual corresponding author playing the role of spokesperson, which kind of illustrates the general point that all of these roles can be played both by individuals and by collectives. Um, I'd be really interested if that's uh, also your sense of what's going on, because uh, yeah, I, I defer to high energy physics researchers on their own intellectual culture. All right, thanks, Josh. I mean, we might, I mean, it might be tricky to follow this up through the online Q&A, but you guys can maybe get in touch through email later. Uh, we have other questions. 
So um, here's a question from Sovik Dasgupta on the responsibilities involved in authorship. Um, so he gives an example. Uh, oftentimes I've come across errors in data interpretation or faulty citations of previous papers, which I've pointed out to the corresponding authors. But in spite of doing that, um, in spite of the journal or the authors committing to publishing uh, corrections, often nothing happens. So with whom does the responsibility to correct the record lie, do you think? And does your proposal say anything about that? Yeah, this is a good question. So I think there's a way in which um, publishing in journals is like rather unlike uh, talking in a conversation, right? Because you can change a position in a conversation, you can elaborate and then make things uh, clearer or uh, put in more reasons or things like that. Um, and there's a way in which kind of journal paper is just like, here's a static assertion and a set of reasons to support it. So one thing we might want to think about in uh, research is the possibilities for like post-publication peer review and then ways of like uh, elaborating on or uh, yeah, retracting as Lex was talking about, but also like um, uh, adding in extra reasons to a paper. So I think, this is important, but I'm not, I'm not sure a, a kind of like a, a set of authorship guidelines would uh, help us to deal with this, but maybe there's a way in which we can kind of unsettle the kind of uh, published paper as this very static thing and allow for more changes post publication within a, um, a controlled sort of way, just as you can on an archive, right? You can have controlled versions which um, change over time. Maybe that's important to have in published papers as well. Right. So, Josh, a quick thing. Can you stop your screen sharing so people can actually see you a bit larger on their screens? Um, Absolutely. Thanks. Great. Um, so, actually, Jeff responded to your earlier uh, uh, response to his question. Um, so, he suggests maybe perhaps our spokespersons are what you call guarantors. So, that would maybe sort of get at what's going on or solve what's going on. Um, a question from Tamarinde Haven. Where do peer reviewers fit into your proposal? Would peer reviewers be guarantors or something else? Yeah, good. So there's a way, there's kind of like two answers to that question. So there's one way in which like, uh, if you're optimistic about the um, truth filtering functions of peer review, uh, and I don't think we should be in general, like in some disciplines, maybe peer reviews reliable, maybe in other disciplines it's like not, or it's not its function. Um, then kind of peer review itself plays some kind of guarantor role. Um, but there's also roles which might be played by individual peer reviewers who you take this proposal, who could say to a journal like, oh, do you want to put me on as a guarantor of this paper? Like just as on in books, you have um, uh, kind of author, um, uh, uh, what do you, I've forgotten the word. On the back of a book, you'll have people who are like, yes, this book is great, excellent, go read it. And yeah. um, you can kind of have those for academic papers as well. And maybe uh, peer reviewers are the right people to do that. <laughs> Cheerleaders or blurb writers. <laughs> the blurb is the right word, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so a question about the legal side of things here uh, from Stefan mm. Thiel. If I'm an author, do I have the rights to intellectual property described in the paper? Is does that follow or is, do you think that's a good way to go? This is just massively complicated, right? So um, an important bit of the history of authorship that I left out is that it turns out in the kind of historical record, our conception of authorship and the way authorship is dealt with um, happens through um, disputes about plagiarism and disputes about copyright right so there's a kind of way in which like there were first disputes about copyright and then our conception of authorship like was formed through those set of disputes so right authorship is a kind of claim to intellectual property and um, all of those issues are just like super complicated uh like legally and philosophically complicated so i just haven't dealt with them here that's like a really important issue for future research and just in general for like um co-authored research like yeah there's there's a bunch of really difficult issues about how to think about um copyright in these kinds of cases and like whether copyright is doing useful things for uh collective inquiry or not so yeah super important set of questions and um, there's uh some really good work which is done by historians of science uh on these set of issues and i'm blanking on the name of the author now but there's lots of there's lots of cool stuff out there all right thanks um, a question from Katerina Bayer. 
Uh, if the guarantor doesn't necessarily have to have contributed to the research or the project, how is she or he different from an honorary author, something that many authorship guidelines won't explicitly exclude? Right, excellent. Uh, this question is dead on. Basically, these are honorary authors, but I'm trying to suggest kind of implicitly uh, there's something good about honorary authors, right? So there's something bad about them too, right? So honorary authors are bad because like um, including them indicates they've done work, which they haven't done, right? If you just put a senior scientist from the field in because that's going to get more people to read the paper, you've um, implied something false about who did research on the paper. But there's something good about that inclusion as well, right? Because it means that the paper might get taken exactly as seriously as it should be, given the right credibility uh, assignment. And uh, that's a useful thing for kind of the communication of results. So what I'm trying to do by distinguishing between contributor and guarantor is to allow for the good bit of honorary uh, authorship, which is the uh, making sure that the research is read by the right people without the bad bit, which is kind of communicating false things about how, who did research. Um, now, this is going to mean that that role is going to need to be held like particularly accountable so that people can't just like put them on themselves on as like guarantors on like loads of papers and then uh, not allow themselves to be held responsible. But um, yeah, the question is dead on. I'm, I'm, I am trying to like <laughs> regiment honorary authorship in a way that like keeps its good bits, but gets rid of its bad bits. All right. Yeah, it's a delicate balance, I guess. Um, so a question from Fahime Marafat. Nowadays, journals ask for a clear description of each individual's contribution. So, you know, this person did the conceptualization, <coughs> this other person did the data mining, and so on and so forth. Um, so each individual is, is held responsible for the section or the bits of the paper that they took care of. Um, how does that fit with your proposal? Do you think it's essentially the same thing, or are there clear differences there? So, um, I think what I'm trying to do is to distinguish, like, the... Um, different con kind of conceptual functions associated with authorship. So some of them are like forward looking as well as being like back backward looking to do with who did what research. There's a question, but there's a big question here about like how a contributor's list should look. So on the list that I had, it was just alphabetical, um, but you could include with a contributor list, like a contribution statement about who did what, you might want to split it into different kinds of roles. And there's just like a kind of whole set of options here. Um, but like, there's difficult questions here, right? So like, is it useful to know who did what, or does that require uh, researchers to both do a paper and then like basically write a paper about who did what in their research and then like not publish that, but use it to construct their contribution statement. I think in some cases that's gonna be really useful, but in other cases, it's not gonna be really useful. One of the points about the high energy physics community is they've decided it's really not helpful for us to write contribution statements for all our papers like uh, that effort doesn't give a kind of corresponding like benefit to the intellectual community so we're just gonna we're just gonna list everyone and i think discipline should be allowed to go both ways right so just have contribution statements um sorry contribution lists which are alphabetical uh or have like quite detailed descriptions of who did what right um, a question from Bert Segers. Uh, suppose we take your proposal as sort of authorship 2.0 or maybe 3.0 or 4.0 in 2030. Um, how do you see this becoming reality? What sort of specific or concrete steps would individuals, institutions, journals, etc., have to take to implement this? Good. So as individuals, I think the thing that one can do is to like <laughs> write better contribution statements, right? That's the thing which lots of journals allow you to do. They allow you to write like acknowledgements or contribution statements. And you can like think about, right, what's going on here? What am I doing in writing this? Am I just saying thanks to some people or am I trying to construct something like this set of like contributor, speaker, writer, guarantor roles? And you can uh, have that feed into how you write your contribution statement or your acknowledgement section. If you want to be a bit more chaotic, like I've done with this paper, you can say, oh, I want to um, uh, list my byline in this kind of way on the first page of the paper, and you can do that. Um, that kind of starts to put pressure on, or at least to like poke journals to kind of allow this kind of practice. And I think uh, there's a kind of way in which it could emerge ground up, but some journals are going to need to get on board and, uh, um, 
uh, yeah, allow, allow at least allow this kind of proposal to go on. There's, I mean, there's a way in which it's kind of radical, but it's also kind of not radical, right? Like a lot of things are going on kind of already, right? So the ICJME guidelines were already motivated by some of the same by the Rennie Yank Emanuel paper. Um, so these kind of lots of these ideas are kind of in the air, I think, for journal editors and publication ethics uh, people. It's just the specific version is a different way to regiment the byline. Right, good. Uh, so a final question before we uh, break, uh, and this is, you know, asking for a friend. Uh, so where do you see this proposal going if it were implemented in, in the humanities or maybe specifically philosophy where single authored papers are often still the norm? Right. So here's my take on philosophy. Philosophy is almost never single authored. What we just do is we put the writer on as the author and we either leave out contributors or we um, put them in the acknowledgements. So what happens for a bunch of humanities disciplines is that we should be putting many more people in the acknowledgements and saying it's not just like thanking people, but these are people who contributed to the intellectual achievement of the paper in a bunch of different ways. So uh, more, more people go in the acknowledgements uh, as I have in this paper, put a lot of people on the contributor list and that acknowledgement section becomes not just kind of like something informal, but something that's really important to uh, the scholarly record about like uh, attributing credit for uh, intellectual discovery. Yeah, makes sense to me. All right, Josh, so thanks a lot for this. This was very, very stimulating, uh, provocative even sometimes. So a virtual round of applause for you as well. Um, to our audience, thanks also for contributing to a lively discussion. We'll break for coffee, tea, or whatever you prefer now, and we'll be back here at 11.15. Hope to see you again then. <laughs>